So hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Market Watch podcast. And I'm joined with Head of Trading, Piers Curran. And Piers, the 55-year wait is over. Oh, it's been a long time. <laughs> been a long time. But, you know, let's not get overexcited. I, you know, the, the, the main job's in front of us. So, you know. And I did put out a I did put out a question actually to to the people in our community um, the morning after the win against yeah. Denmark, and I said, "Come on, what's the score of the final?" And uh, people very bearish England to be fair, which I was a little oh. bit disappointed in because I do have some stats here I want to run through. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to be typically British about this. I just want to say, look, England are going to win. And yeah, that's I mean, it. That's final. Like, I mean, I feel quite confident personally, but I perhaps let me give you some, throw some stats okay. your way and then All you right, can make a more inf informed decision perhaps. Go ahead. But, um, okay. So, um, England have won just one of the last eight meetings between these two nations, England and Italy. Yeah. You'd have to go all the way back ha to August, 2012. How now, many of Italy, how many of Italy won though? I mean, how many draws have been in there? So the last two matches, both friendlies, have ended 1-1 draws. Okay. okay. Um, but if we go back to August 2012 well, and England last beat Italy, can you tell yeah. me who scored the decisive goal for England? Oof, August 2012? Uh, it's probably uh, most likely going to be someone like Rooney. Jermaine Defoe off the oh, bench last minute. Jermaine Defoe, Tottenham legend. Okay. <laughs> I should have known that. Okay, so it's but a look, few more. Hey, before before you go on with your stats, this is a classic um, example of spinning stats in a certain way when actually you don't have all the information, and so you've got no right to make the assertion that you're making. So my point is, England have only won one of the last eight games against Italy. Fact. Right, but with that, it may be that Italy have only won one, and there have been six draws. So actually, it's very even. And actually, to further cement what you're saying, um, I think it's highly inappropriate to look back that far, because right. this yeah. is totally different teams. Um, nearly every well, yeah, every single player is different, right? And yeah, actually, yeah. the FIFA World Rankings would have England at four and Italy at ten, I think it is. So, right. in actuality, based on form, performance, and bringing it into the context of today, England yeah. are the favourites, undoubtedly. Forget the past, Oof, hence my yeah. hence my confidence. So, <laughs> I'm not sure about undoubtedly favourites. I mean, go on, carry on. What, what you got? Some more stats? Yeah. Italy are unbeaten in their last 33 matches yeah, in all now, competitions. Right. That, that for me, I mean, to say that England are undoubtedly favourites, I think is a, that's an irrational sort of British or sorry, English mentality. I think that, that stat right there is the biggest one to fear. They've scored 86 goals. They conceded just 10 on that run. Yeah. That's the longest unbeaten stretch of matches for Italy in their history. Yeah. So they're coming is, into this. Isn't it for, for anyone, isn't it? I, I think not just Italy. Mm, possibly. I think, I think that is actually a world record. Okay. So England then, another stat. They've won 15 of their last 17 matches at Wembley Stadium. Right. In all competitions. And are unbeaten in their last 12 in all competitions, keeping 10 clean sheets. Yeah. Um, how much of a, uh, of a factor do you think Wembley plays? Massive. So I think, look, I think this is a, I think, I think they're two very um, equal-ish sides. I think they're, 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 the stats you just rolled out there, you know, especially Italy unbeaten in 33, but England, you know, what, what did you say? One ten of the last 12 and or whatever it was. I mean, look, these are the two form sides, hence why they're in the final. Um, and I think the, to, I think Italy's advantage, haven't lost in 33, is offset by England's home advantage for this match. Uh, and I think that, yeah, I honestly think that's a really big advantage and, and mm. an unfair one, but pff, hey, it's got to be played somewhere, right? Italy won the World Cup, where? In Italy. France won the World Cup, where? 
in France. England won the World Cup in 1966. Where did that happen? Oh, yeah, at Wembley. You know, home advantage historically has been huge. Um, Argentina won the World Cup. Where was that? Oh, it was in Argentina. So you may, don't, don't, don't make me even more bullish about this, <laughs> Um, But my favorite, well, your favorite stat, I should say, uh, I've left till last, which is Harry Kane. Yeah, go on. Um, has been directly involved in 28 goals in the, his last 27 appearances for England in all competitions. 19 goals, nine assists. One more goal from Harry Kane will see him become England's outright highest goal scorer in major tournaments, superseding Mr. Gary Lineker. Yeah. The man, the legend. I mean, I mean, what, what more can be said? Best striker in the world, but not only scoring goals, creating them. So Italy, and it, here's the thing, right? Italy, their defense is, sorry about my dog in the background. Their defense is the most experienced defense in the world. But with that, so they're quite, quite canny, um, but they're very old. Um, they've got a combined, their two centre backs combined age of 70. And I think this is the key, right? It's England's pace from like Sterling or Sacco, let's say, whoever's going to play. But, and then with, with Kane kind of splitting the defence with balls, like, like for the goal against um, Denmark, the first goal. So I think Italy's defence is going to come unstuck by Kane plus England's pace. And they're too old. And I think 33 unbeaten, but on Sunday, sorry, that record's going to be taken away. Are you going to put yourself out there for an end score? Uh, I yeah, I think you know I'm, I'm continuing my bullish English um, attitude, and I think I think it's going to be an early. If England can get an early goal, a bit like against sort of Ukraine, then I think it could be. Well, I'm going to go three one. Well, actually, you know what? I'm going to go four one. Kane hat trick. Wow. <laughs> and that's you know why I've chosen that score line with a hat trick. No, go on. A certain Sir Jeff Hurst scored a hat trick and England won four one uh -huh. in nineteen sixty six. Or was it four two? Anyway. Anyway, I think we're gonna win. Uh, what I would say about the game, I mean, there's been a lot of backlash about the way England beat Denmark with regards to the penalty, with regards to the the laser. Did you did you see that? There was some some yeah. idiot in the crowd was flashing a laser on Schmeichel's face. And I think unfortunately that has soured the victory quite considerably. And I think a lot of um if you if you look at the media outside of the outside of England, let's say, then they they're certainly kind of picking up on all of that stuff. Um and, and I I think it's unfair to say that England cheated and got through unfairly. Mm. I think that's going too far. I mean, in the end, Schmeichel saved the penalty. So the laser couldn't have had too much of an impact. And yeah, the ref's decision for the penalty to be given, I mean, all right, fine, was super, super soft. Um, but, you know, you take, you take these. We've had some bad luck in the past. Um, Lampard scoring against Germany, for example, and the goal not being given. Um, I remember that, yeah. Right. And the same happened to Campbell. Um, in 98. So we've definitely had some bad luck. What about Maradona? 1986 <laughs> punched it into the net, <laughs> you know, literally punched it in. That's still one of the highlights of so, uh, just memorable know, moments. We've had our bad luck. Um, and anyway, the stat we, we beat that. I think we deserve to win that game. Um, you know, dominated possession, eight shots on target to their two. Um, Oh, sorry, 10 shots on target to their three, eight shots off target to their two. So I think we dominated and we deserve to win. I think we're rightfully in the final. And I think we're going to do the job. Yeah, I almost kind of like the fact that it's Italy in the final because I think that I think it's often more difficult. And I think the English mentality of sport in general is often this has been a, a, a weighted factor on the shoulders of performers. And it's, you know, tackling teams like Denmark is always tricky. Right. But then Italy, I mean, you hear the stat, they never lost in 33, but you're playing at home at Wembley, 55 yeah. years. Like, that's just going to give you so much adrenaline. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, just can you overcome, I guess, the nerves and the pressure? But overall, 
um, I think it is a it's a positive factor um, in that respect. But yeah, and I and I think just to kind of finish, I think that another criticism has been that oh, it's been unfair. England have had such an easy route to the final. You know, Ukraine, Denmark. I mean, come on. So, but obviously, in a, in any tournament, in the end, to win it, you you're going to have to beat the best. And so, you know, ultimately, if we do win it, then it will be fully deserved in you know, taking away Italy's 33 unbeaten run, um, that will be a huge achievement. So, yeah, you, 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 if England win, then it would have been deserved, of course. If we win, Boris has been um, talking about a bank holiday. It's going to throw in a bank holiday special on the 19th when also he drops all the lockdown measures. Ah, is, is that right? Oh, God, imagine. I was going to say, because some people are saying bank holiday on Monday, literally the, the, the day after, <laughs> but of course that... that no, of course, it's not It's not maximum happen. political PR yeah, impact for, for the Boris Johnson government. Let's just throw it in the bank holiday on Freedom Day. Yeah, oh, um, God, imagine. And I have to say, you know, for all the pubs and the, the, the kind of restaurants out there, this has just been absolutely perfect, amazing. Right, given the the year they've had, this for their businesses and, and for people's livelihoods, um, and obviously outside of just that economic thing, it's just the mood of the nation. Um, you know, you can't. It's hard, very hard to measure it, but it's a very powerful, um, you know, collective force. And you know, from a consumption point of view and from an economic point of view, you know, England going all the way here. Um, definitely has a, a positive contributing factor, a meaningful positive contributing factor to the to the overall economic situation. Okay, I have a stat on that. <laughs> Ooh, of course, De Deutsche Bank put out some research, and in France, for example, UEFA estimated the Euro 2016 injected over 1.2 billion euros into the French economy in right. 2016. In Portugal, 2004. Income generated. This is just income generated from the tournament. Yeah, um, was estimated at just under a billion. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess this time it's a bit different for two reasons. In that the tournament has been spread all over Europe. Yeah. Plus, of course, there's been a, a, a very restricted number of kind of international fans coming in. So I think from that point of view the economic bonus will be a, a lot, lot lower than previous tournaments. But I, but I think just the British getting out and, and enjoying and being positive and spending money, you know, can, can have a, a meaningful effect. I keep saying British, sorry, English. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure the Welsh and the Scottish and the Northern <laughs> Irish are not enjoying what they're seeing. Yeah, well, I certainly know from... Um, one of our Scottish employees. Yes, He's been um, changing over his Scottish football shirt with the respective flag of whoever <laughs> England is playing against. So he'll be uh, sporting his Scottish Italian football top. On, I think uh, the Sunday. classic was during the Ukraine game. I think it was. I think we'd got to three 0 He'd already changed it to to a Denmark top, uh, <laughs> even though the Ukraine match hadn't finished. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But that, that goes to my point as well. I mean, Scotland, I mean, here we are, and Scotland we could, couldn't see that through. But that's why I think that that edge, that just that kind of um, just being up for it, the challenge, I think it always helps when you're playing the best. I do yeah. thoroughly believe in that uh, as a statement of intent. But um, all right, yeah. well, let's get to markets then. And let's talk about um, this week, because although England reaching the Euro final is obviously the major news, there's been a really busy week in markets, in fact, and it almost feels like it's been a, a distinct shift now. And it'd be interesting to get your take on what you think of where we go from here. And um, I'm going to provide a bit of context. So US government bonds have been rallying pretty much all week. Um, European equities, Wall Street, um, indices came under some considerable selling pressure yesterday. However, I would say that in the futures market this morning, as we're recording this on Friday, a lot of that has already been recovered. But generally, worries about inflation, interest rate rises uh, were replaced almost, it seems, by the global economic recovery. And so with that, 
uh, obviously we can talk a little bit about COVID and vaccines and China and so on. But the yield on a 10-year Treasury bond um, is at its lowest level since early February, and it's on track for its biggest weekly drop since June of 2020. Um, the European equity market, which is stacked with cyclical companies, which benefit obviously from economic growth, given what we're suggesting is that's being debated whether and being questioned, uh, they've seen a pretty broad pullback. And interesting on a sector perspective, those financials, which we talked about in the recent podcast, which were kind of, we were saying, thriving at the time because of the yeah. fact that rate expectations were moving higher. Well, this week alone, they're down 5 6%. And who's the, the biggest performers? The mega cap tech stocks. The juggernaut that is Amazon continues to take over the world, and they're up nearly 10%. 10%. Just this week. In a, in a week. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. So year-to-date returns on growth stocks now this week have flipped and then they're now outperforming value, which that was a big thing people were talking about a few months back. We kind of, that's the end now of that big outperformance in growth. And, and here we are, it's flipped again. So initial thoughts on, on some of these moves. Yeah, it's, just, it's been a weird week, definitely. And it, I think um, in the heat of the moment, it feels like something big's happening, but then you kind of, scramble around for a specific uh, event or headline or news to kind of justify it. And then you're like, well, all right, there's a li- there's little bits here and there, but I mean, I, I find it they're just kind of stepping back from it all. It, it's very, I, th- I think we're in that little shift that week, let's say where the, um, uh, the, the mood subtly shifts and maybe you're seeing actual uh, strategy changing so when these big asset managers are are making strategy shifts then of course it creates quite a lot of market volatility because they're obviously executing very large trades to make those strategy changes and those very large trades are the things that are impacting the market price and driving prices you know up and down if you go back to the start of the year it's quite interesting right so listen to this at the start of the year what were we worried about? We were worried that, you know, as, as the COVID situation was lifting, vaccines, blah, 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 and there's so much stimulus being pumped in, we were worried about that because we thought, hang on, that's going to lead to too rapid growth and it's going to lead to inflation pumping higher and this is going to push yields higher, right? And we were, that's what we were worried about, okay? So we were almost, we were worried about too much stimulus, too rapid growth, too high inflation, too high yields. That's what we were worried about. Today, we're worried about the exact opposite. So we're worried about stimulus stopping. We're worried about growth slowing. We're worried about inflation and yields dropping. So do you see how irrational all of that is? What we were worried about six months ago is exactly flipped. But instead of now being happy with that, because all of those worries have gone away, we're just now worried about the exact opposite. And I think this kind of plays out nicely in what you've just said there with regards to value versus growth. Um, And just so everybody's 100% clear, uh, value investing, you know, like Buffett is like the king of value investing, all right? That's about finding undervalued companies, companies that are trading at a share price that kind of values them below their book value, for example. And it's about investing in those companies and then those companies, you know, over the long term um, coming through and and returning back to value, okay? And often you'll find that the value stocks are your less exciting ones. You'll often find that they're more defensive, you you know, stuff like healthcare and utilities and food retailers, and often they're dividend paying stocks as well, okay? Um, So that's your value investing. Growth well, take Amazon, right? Why would you buy Amazon shares? They're certainly not undervalued, okay? So they're not a value stock, but they're growth. So you're buying them now, even though you could argue the value today is correct for the company today, but you're obviously buying them because you believe that company can grow in the future and therefore the value of it is going to go up through growth, okay? So that's value versus growth. Now, earlier in the year, we were worried about inflation and inflation has a really negative impact on some of these growth stocks. And that's why then people rotated into value. And, you know, financials are a funny one because um, 
you know, the financials benefited from earlier in the year because, you know, you mentioned yields. So the yield curve steepened earlier in the year. And that's because rates were staying low and the Fed was super dovish. But at the same time, inflation was really starting to, to ramp up. And that was pushing up the long end of the yield curve, making the yield curve steeper. That's perfect for banks. It's perfect for their loan books. They're kind of borrowing on the short term where rates are really low. And they're lending on the long term where rates are relatively higher. And that's so their profit margin is really described by the steepness of the yield curve. So what's happened this week? Well, as you said, yields have, have dumped uh, on the long end. And so, I mean, they've gone down on the short end as well, but not as much. So you've seen the yield curve flatten. So that's the long end has come down more than the short end. That differential between long-term yields and short-term yields has narrowed. And that's the bank's profit margin, right? So that the profit margin for banks' loan books has narrowed. And that's why you've seen some of these financial stocks, particularly, uh, suffering this week. Yeah, and just going back to the kind of catalysts then of what we've had, I thought there was a few different areas that we can talk about. First one is the the, the kind of, it's almost like the the match that lit the fire, it seems, for some of these moves was the ISM non-manufacturing PMI. So that came in at 60.6 for the month of June. Um, but that was that was sharply below even the most pessimistic estimate on the what, street. What is that? ISM... So, Non-manufacturing PMI. So to, to give you the, the summary, it's effectively then a survey conducted with purchaser managers. And think of the, the ISM stands for the Institute of Supply Management, and they look at the nationwide picture in America on two fronts, manufacturing and non-manufacturing, i.e. services. And the one we had um, this week was services. And that's, that's a big focal point, given the composition of the way you know, consumption in, in the US in terms of its economic picture and its activity. And a lot of people were looking at that based on the premise that it will remain robust because we, 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 we are reopening at this point in time through increased vaccination rates and so on and so forth. Um, it didn't happen. The number was considerably weaker than expected. Um, and how these reports from from ISM and the PMIs are uh, uh, broken down into as different components. And that allows us as market participants to look at different parts of um, in a more granular level, like new orders, um, imports, production, inventories, prices. So we get almost an inflation metric reading. But important one, obviously, that's very markets are very sensitive to is the jobs market. And this, yeah. of course, comes on the coattails of what we had from payrolls. Payrolls was perfectly okay. It just wasn't spectacular by any means. And this employment component within the service sector in America went from 59.9 to 49.9, which is a, by, I mean, if you're not used to looking at this data, that's a pretty spectacular fall. And the way that these PMIs are calculated is that 50 is kind of like the marker in the sand, which is above 50 is an expansion of that particular um, component and below is a contraction. So we are contracting in that specific area of jobs in the service sector over that month, at least in, in but, America. But how much of that is to do with all the things we've been talking about on previous podcasts around these basically labor supply chain issues where you know, in that services sector, uh, people aren't, they don't want to go back to work. Um, and so there's plenty of jobs available, just no one, no one wants them yet. Um, so how, how, in your view, that ISM shock, oh my God, it's dropped. Hang on, that wasn't part of the equation. Panic, maybe the, maybe growth slowing, and then all of the associated arguments. Just stop. Is, isn't it, a, isn't it more this time, isn't it more to do with that labor supply chain issue yeah i mean i i, I agree and I, I mean it's even take it one step further i actually think that the entire move this week is a bit overdone to be quite honest with you because yeah. going further forward in time uh, covid globally is going to get worse we know that because the delta variant and so it, that's not a big surprise but obviously warrants being very vigilant as to the ramification that might have on lockdown strategies and economic activity 
but I do think that we get that under control, whether now in the further future and going further forward. And so I don't know. I don't think this is that, again, like what you said at the beginning of the year, we were kind of overstretching our imaginations about the inflation risks and economic boom. Now we're overreacting to the other side of that. And yeah. I do think that longer term, that I still think there is room for yields to continue to go up. It's just yeah. not right now, <laughs> not today, perhaps. But um, I think this is just a momentary blip, I personally, when we yeah. start looking at a, a, a multi-month picture rather than just a week's perspective. So, yeah, I think that you're right. I think that we shouldn't overly obsess about that figure because there's some explanation. I do anticipate that that job market will continue to tighten over time because then people will go back to work. And so... Yeah. And it's not about it's, it's about making sure don't don't confuse this with a risk off move, um, even though equities dumped sharply, um, you know that that on that well on on that one day in particular, um, you know I, I mean I say equities I mean broad indices did, did have a sharp down date they're still right up at their all time highs by the way but it was definitely a kind of sector rotation because as you said Amazon up ten percent this week. So it's definitely a sector rotation play. Um, so as I said, a, a, a quite a meaningful strategy shift. And look, it's come at the end of the first half of the year. And this is typically when asset managers are looking at, you know, they've got their quarterly performances done. And so now they're, you know, it's a very important moment in the year, right? Halfway through. And, and they're very much making bigger strategy changes at these kind of key milestones during the year and so i think that's what's happened you, you've seen a quite a meaningful strategy shift back towards growth i mean look it's not a risk risk off i know when you look at the 10-year us bonds and it's like oh my god it's price has gone through the roof and, and yields have dropped sharply and that that's like a risk off right but then actually if you look at some of the other parts of the bond markets like junk bonds which are high yield bonds they're trading at record low yields still um, and so, you, you know, if it was a risk off, like a meaningful risk off, then you'd definitely be getting movement down there as well. And, you, and we didn't. So actually, another thing to say is that the, the Fed have subtly shifted their, their stance right over the last few weeks and starting in, on June the 16th when we had that Fed meeting. So over the last three weeks, the Fed's slight change in direction is playing out in markets. And I actually think some of this T-note move to the upside, I think some of it could be a, a sort of currency play as well, where you're getting international investors now say, well, look, the dollar's been super weak all year because the Fed have been over, overly dovish. That kind of journey's done. So maybe the dollar is going to strengthen for the second half of the year. So it'll be dollar-dominated assets. And one of the best ones to buy, obviously, is T-notes from a sort of risk play. So it could well be that you're getting some currency, global currency strategy plays coming into that, that T-note move. And, and as you mentioned briefly, there was a technical factor that, that also helped with that T-note move just because we, we broke a, a very key um, technical level. And from, from the kind of price point of view, it was the June high. So from the yield point of view, it was the June low, right? And so um, that got taken out quite sharply on Tuesday, which helped to just propel, it, it exaggerated the move. Um, now, for a lot of um, our listeners, they might not just be trading, but investing. And we're very fortunate enough to have quite a senior portfolio manager i mean when i say senior he he, he just manages 17 billion dollars so yeah something's you know. been built <laughs> so but yeah he was he was very um he was very good in what he was explaining because he was talking about and perhaps you know you were the one hosting the conversation this idea about the um uh active and passive and how it was like you know, when the markets just when asset prices are going up like what yeah. we have been seeing the initial phase of the beginning of a cycle, it's always the easiest part. Now it gets complicated. For, yeah. for, but now this is when active management can actually be more effective in a way because there's more yeah. opportunity rather than this everything, everything rallies right. philosophy. I think the hard work's just about to start. Right. I think that the easy, the easy wins, they're behind us now. And there have been some really really easy wins um it's not quite 
I wouldn't quite as broadly say everything's gone up, but it's not far off, right? But as Hanny was saying, if you're an active fund manager where you've got to deliver alpha, that's your job. That means you've got to outperform the index. That's incredibly difficult when the index is just going through the roof. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's great. Everyone's making money. But as an active fund manager, you've got to beat that index. And that's incredibly hard. Um, but now, it, and, and the early phase of the cycle, so that's the, that's the part of the economic cycle that comes immediately after the recession. That, that kind of rebound relief, you know, we're back. You, this is where equity markets move the most. And this is where the upside potential for stocks is the greatest. And that's why it's easy to make money in the early part of the cycle, just buy an index tracker, right? But now the hard work begins where even if economic growth rates do decelerate, so they stay positive, but they, and they will, right? So economic growth rates are going to decelerate in the second half of this year and in 2022, they'll stay positive. So we'll have growth economies, but just at a slower rate. This is the mid part of the cycle. And that's the part of the cycle where, you know, equity is still positive for equities. Don't get, don't get me wrong, but, you know, growth potential, equity capital appreciation potentials lower. So this is where the active fund manager now, it's easier for them to beat the index just because the index isn't performing as well. And so here it's about trying to find pockets and this is about sector rotation play. And that's why I'm saying, I do believe this week, it looks like from how markets have behaved, you've had a pretty major, almost like industry wide shift in strategy which has just led to a lot of execution to put these new new trades on and to shift around their asset allocations. Uh, and that's created a lot of market kind of short-term market disruption, but I think things will settle. And, and yeah, we move into the second half of the year where as we knew was going to happen, inflation is going to start dropping, um, you know, and so it's not like any of this is, is a surprise. It's just a, if you're in the heat of the moment, and you're less experienced, and uh, you know oil's jump, dropping five dollars, and the ten-year yield spiking through the roof, and oh my god, the S and P's down fifty points, and you know you can really get carried away with all of that. And, and in that microcosm of that moment, you can think, wow, hang on, something massive is happening, when actually it's not. Well, look, that's that, that's the voice of experience there talking. <laughs> uh, but um, look, there's two other areas then I want to I want to cover um, in this podcast, which is other contributing factors to 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 a certain degree that have created this type of sentiment shift or, or strategy shift, as you say, China, and then we'll talk about COVID and vaccine. So starting off with China, there's been some interesting developments on different fronts, really, with China at the moment. Um, on Wednesday this week, the government said it would use quote timely cuts in the bank's reserve requ uh, requirement ratio, so the triple R, as they call it, to keep money flowing around the economy. Now, a lot of that's coming on the back of the fact that um, some of the economic data in China has started to, to moderate from very high levels. Remember, China was really quick out the gate on the kind of reopening trade uh, against the kind of Western world. And so now that's coming off the boil. And so as they were ahead before, they're almost ahead in, in the downturn as well. And the fact that they've already are talking about decreasing the triple R has got people thinking, well, Chinese Q2 GDP is out next week. Yeah. Surely they know that this is going to be slightly softer. Um, and so therefore they're prepping this up. And in combination with that, we've had some inflation metrics come out overnight. So to end this week, and as you will know, there's a big divergence between PPI and CPI. Um, CPI has always remained fairly lackluster throughout, hasn't really shown that um, any pickup at all. Whereas because of that commodity boom that we've seen, PPI has gone really high, but PPI came off as well last night. So it went from only a, a minor amount, 8.8 um, .8 from 9%. But it does come as well with you know, the fact that they've been opening up their, their um, SPR and they've been releasing some commodities. We talked about this in a previous podcast episode. So the fact that inflation is also easing, does that also give them further reason to want to ease? And we know they're very interventionalist and to, to keep the market ticking over at a high, high momentum. Other things, of course, today, Washington are going to add at least 10 more Chinese entities to its economic blacklist. This is all to do with human rights issues. So that tit for tat 
kind of very standoffish stance between the US and China trade dialogue is pretty much the status quo at the moment. And then the final thing is internally, we've had big technology crackdowns continuing in China. And that's really weighed on their local market. And in Hong Kong, the stock index in the Hang Seng, um, a lot of those tech firms getting hit. Um, car, car hailing firm, kind of the Chinese Uber, Didi, um, they've, the, Beijing basically stopped them signing up new users just days after they IPO'd. Uh, um, it was the second biggest American IPO for a Chinese company, and they've stepped in going, what are you doing with your data? We want your data, please. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I definitely think for me, there's, this is definitely, there's, there's a few different angles here politically, but I guess focusing on the economic one, which is the one that kind of fits the narrative of what we're discussing. Um, China, China is, is slowing and their, their central bank is looking to ease. And so as much as we were talking about tightening and hiking and all these other ideas, they're almost going the opposite direction, at least at the moment, is what they're hinting. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard one, isn't it, to judge? I mean, you're right. Historically, those, you know, cutting a surprise cut to the reserve requirement ratio, um, which just kind of gives banks more license to lend more money, which is then extra credit for the economy. So it's a, it's a kind of, it's a diluted version of a rate cut um, in, in some ways, right? And so... Um, it, historically, that happening, yeah, you know, surprise reserve requirement ratio cut from China would normally, as you're saying and alluded to, would normally be front running what then becomes bad economic data. So I think we'll have to wait and see. I mean, GDP figures this year are kind of just a bit insane. So it's very hard. I mean, look, their quarter one GDP was 18.3%. So, yeah, you know, even if it comes in, I don't know what it might come in at, right? But it's a bit of a nonsense until we get a few more quarters down the line. And this wild kind of GDP disruption kind of smooths. And then and then we'll kind of know where we are. So it's very difficult. But yeah, the fact they are making, well, if they do make a move on the RRR, yeah, then fine. That's an indication that things are slowing, um, which is not good. But I'm just looking at their COVID cases, though, and it's, I don't know if you can believe these, but their their COVID cases don't, uh, you know, they're pretty much basically zero still. But is can that be true? Um, yeah. So th- th- this fits into. Um, so I was, I was fortunate enough to be to be running a group at Namura um, this week, and really keen kind of interns that they've got in for the summer, and we were talking about high frequency data points. And, and certainly that, that was a good one that I was using as an example was the inability to really have transparency of, of genuine of what we can deem as credible, that the statistics don't really stack up when we're having a global picture with a Delta variant, highly transmissible, you know, you can't have a country of that population not reporting any cases. It's just not statistically yeah. hard to believe. And so um, this was the idea that you could track other meaningful high frequency data points um, and I remember back in this is probably going back to late February it was coming coming out the back end of um, the Chinese Lunar New Year holidays at the beginning of 2020 before the coronavirus left let's say China and then moved to Iran Italy northern Italy if you remember South Korea and the likes and we were tracking at, the, at that time um, on TomTom the actual real-time traffic in downtown Shanghai and Beijing. <laughs> and actually, it was very meaningful data. And um, we were looking at um, energy, electricity consumption in a lot of these right. major cities. And we were looking yeah. at different you know, measurements, uh, thinking creatively, quite laterally, of ways of which we could look at mobility. Because then you could tell what the authorities were doing without them actually being explicit to give you an idea then of how severe or not this case was. And that, so, so from what you've said, I, I certainly would be, yeah, um, looking at the Chinese uh, official above board data with somewhat skepticism, but I, that, those would be the ways and means I'd try to counteract that to find something more valid to base yeah. assumptions on. Um, but yeah, with COVID, so moving over to COVID, um, US COVID-19 cases, Um, are up around 11% over the previous week, almost entirely among people uh, who've not been vaccinated. 
Uh, COVID cases, we heard from the newly appointed Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, um, they're going to go up to 50,000 in the coming weeks and most likely could surge to 100,000 by the summer is what his statistic is. And obviously, this comes ahead of that, that final unlocking, if you like, the happening uh, later on this month. Now, this brought about a couple of things. For one, then, um, the Delta variant definitely is becoming the most dominant um, of the uh, of the case rates globally. I don't think that's a surprise. The US going up 11% over the previous week, I don't think that's a surprise either because we were on the previous podcast and we were talking about the mathematical modeling of the outbreak in America. That number is going to go up for the next couple of weeks. So it's going to get worse, essentially. Same with the UK. But the calculated risk from the government strategy, of course, in the UK's case, is that of those nine key categories, the predominant ones at risk or higher chance of being at risk have been double shot, double shotted, <laughs> if that's a word. And double jabbed. So, double jabbed. And they, so therefore, um, they're at lesser risk. And so they can go ahead. Now, I thought, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that to a certain extent. But then I've been looking at some of the European statistics this morning. And Spain was the one that jumped out. So in Spain, some 40% of the 60 to 69-year-old population in Spain have still not received a second dose. So remember, this took place in England quite a while ago. And hence yeah. the reason why the government can have more confidence, because they were the ones who were you know, likely to be admitted to ICU, put pressure on the infrastructure and the NHS and so on. So the other statistic in Spain... 25% of 40 to 49 age group have not even had a jab yet in Spain. So, so that to me is quite worrying because as we know, this latest um, Delta variant is highly transmissible comparative to the already um, multiple time more transmissible Kent variation that was there, the alpha and so I find it hard to think, and, I, and, and that's why I do think that there there's probably is a bit of a combination of this thrown in to create this week's market moves that we've seen, yeah. which is the fact that, look, okay, in the UK, that's one thing, but elsewhere globally, I mean, I, was, as I said to you earlier this week, check out how many people have been vaccinated in South Africa. I mean, we're talking single digit percentage have only had one. <laughs> Yeah. And then you look at that scaling up in some of the other uh, emerging kind of uh, undeveloped countries. And so Brazil, India, there are incredibly low vaccination rates. I mean, they're heading in the right direction, but very shallow in terms of the speed. Um, and so there's definitely risks, I think, um, still with this, and particularly the mainland Europe one being the fact that, look, I know British travelers are going to have to be have received a double dose but as of the lock as of july 19th there's going to be 140 countries which will now be open for us to travel to including the likes of spain amongst others so yeah it's definitely for me it's, it's a space to watch i think and I, I can't help but feel like we've been here many times before it's kind of like the summer of 2020 if you remember it kind of felt like oh that wasn't so bad <laughs> it's kind of everything improved dramatically only then to get considerably worse again and and i know then we didn't have any vaccine so now is starkly different but um this case rate happening and 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 particularly as well i don't know the data yet because it's too early but um long covid mm. you know these, these young people i mean it's all well and good saying hundred thousand people are going to catch covid oh that's okay they're not going to go into icu so it doesn't matter. So people aren't going to die. Yeah, but what about long-standing health complications of which we, do, we don't know what those are really long-term, but certainly there's evidence to suggest that young people can suffer in different ways other than obviously the worst-case scenario. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's, quite, I mean, there's, quite a bit there's, there. Obviously, there's a huge amount we don't know about this virus. Um, but then there's now a huge amount we do know about it so you know i i always think that ultimately you've got to go with what you know 
even though there are perhaps obviously risks and uncertainties around what we don't know. And, and right now, what we know is, you know, got to get jabbed, got to get this virus. Uh, sorry, got to get this um, vaccine. Um, and then there's a huge problem with that. Yeah, glo the global community needs to be vaccinated. And until that happens, we're going to have waves and waves and waves. Um, and that, that the real risk there is that that enables more variants to breed and grow. And, and, and of course, then there's the risk around the effect, you know, effectiveness of these vaccines that have already been created. Um, yeah, which on that point, um, you'll recall there was that Israeli health ministry study earlier this week. And again, I think this is another contributive factor to some of the nervousness in markets this week. BioNTech Pfizer vaccine was or has been proven less effective at halting the spread of the Delta variant than the previous strains of the coronavirus. The stats being that the vaccine, the BioNTech Pfizer one, is 64% effective at preventing infection among those who are fully inoculated. Uh, efficacy against previous strains, so none uh, other than Delta, was at 94%. Now, that Israeli study, I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket because their numbers are way more dramatic than some other studies have shown. Obviously, the media will latch on to that and pump that story because it's more sensational in a way. But it certainly is interesting. Um, and one thing Pfizer have been working on is they're planning on requesting US emergency authorization as soon as next month for a third booster shot of COVID-19 vaccine. And the data there looks great. I mean, the study early on from initial data from early human uh, trial data has shown that third dose of the existing coronavirus vaccine is safe and can raise neutralizing antibody levels by five to tenfold compared with the original vaccine. So is that just having a third shot of the current vaccine? Or is this is this booster one a new type of? My understanding is just a third shot. Right. They now, see, I, what I've got a real problem with here is, <laughs> yeah. is now all the Americans are going to go for their third shot when half of the world haven't had one. Know what I mean? I think before we start third jabbing the rich... <laughs> We need to get one and two jabs into the poorer nations, but you and I know that that's that's the that's a, a better solution to control the the virus and help the global economy and thus people's lives on a global level. But there's but there's nothing like an existential threat to human life to promote then protection of your tribe. Indeed, and so yeah, I'm afraid. Uh, well, I hope. I should put it that way, that, that we see, we see uh, a better route forward overall. But look, we'll wrap it there. Um, I'll let you, um, you know, go, go and get your England shirt yep. washed and ironed. Dry cleaned. <laughs> uh, well, what, is, is it the Gascoigne 96 one that you'll be... Uh... Uh, I've actually, I'm, I'm going for the 1966 uh, red oh. England shirt. Full sleeve. Um, it's, coming, it's coming home. Okay, and you can check out Piers Curran's Instagram account <laughs> to see that uh, when it comes. But cool. All right, everyone. Uh, stay safe. Take care. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the game. And we'll catch you next week. Cheers. See you all.